All right, guys, I'm back. Seems like I am uh, really just having a lot of fun this week. So the Tactical Perspective Spec Fire is into its second episode today. So welcome to it. Uh, for those of you that uh, aren't picking up what I've been doing the last few days, I've been kind of just pushing out a whole bunch of other thinking I've had on Joe and uh, these one-off, two-off, three-off things. But uh, yeah, I'll have another toy review for you guys on Friday. Probably going to be hitting one of the, my Dreadnoughts that I have on pre-order at the local GameStop here in Ottawa. But on this crappy Monday, because every Monday's crap, we all know this. Uh, even retired Mondays are crap. Uh, I decided I'm going to carry on with some videos that I was thinking about before. Uh, so we're going to do another Spec Fire G.I. Joe Classified Fights. And this time we are going to do number two, and I've decided it will be Storm Shadow and Helix. And I'll tell you why I decided on those two. Uh, because when I do these fights, uh, I really enjoyed seeing those things like uh, Deadliest Warrior and all those other shows uh, years ago. And um, I don't see anybody right now that I've seen doing this, and I thought, what a fun thing to do. Because like uh, Skullfrog said on the first one, there's a lot of things you can do with it. And thanks for commenting on that one, Skullfrog. I appreciate you. Uh, it's, um, it is, it's, you could do this for a while. And I, uh, I find it was fun to think about and fun to kind of stage and come up with rules on how this would go. And I'm gonna carry on with it. So you're probably gonna see a few of them because I have a few of them planned. But why I picked Storm Shadow and Helix? One, because Helix was new and I like Helix. Uh, and it, it's it's a new thing and I wanted to learn more about Helix. So I decided, well, if, I, if I'm gonna learn more about Helix, uh, this is a great way to do it. I'd do a little bit of digging and see how she would stage up in a fight against uh, a worthy adversary such as Storm Shadow, who is <laughs> more than worthy. And the reason I said I would do that is because when I was digging through Helix, I found uh, one of the things they use to just kind of orientate you to how good she is, is they mentioned that she fought Snake Eyes to a standstill at one point. And she, they also mentioned how she goes into these pit arenas, uh, not knowing anything about her opponent and walking out without a scratch because she calculates everything. She has a, an autistic like mind uh, as uh, I think it was either Skullfrog again or Demacism or one of the others. Uh, sorry if I don't mention everybody who makes uh, the right comments. Uh, you know, I don't have my, my comments up on the screen, but man, I, do I ever hear from the right, uh, like the, I hear from you guys and it's the right comments at the right time. It always gives me some uh, enlightenment and uh, one of the things was talked about was is she autistic uh, or on the autistic spectrum and that's uh, yeah clearly in the narrative that's kind of where they're going about how she sees the total organic battlefield uh, and uh, everything has a data set to it and things like that right so that's what I dug up about Helix and uh, when I do these fights I'll follow the, the format just like I have a semi format for my uh, figure reviews in that I'm gonna talk about the characters that I'm pitting up against each other, what they come with, and then I'll break it down. So right now I, I've, I've talked about Helix. I've been a bit outside of my promised format. So I'm gonna tell you what we know about Helix in the right way. So we'll just close that out. And there's our Helix file card. And I'll bring the camera in and we'll talk about this for a bit. So like I said, says that uh, everything we know about her is more or less classified, right? She's uh, she's an asset for Hawk. She's the Intel Intel of Joe, basically. Like, am I, think MI6 and all that other crap. And you're, you're thinking along the right lines, right? She's a very classified, high-level secret character. They call her an alpha-level operative. And like it says in the card, she talks about uh, no one really knows she's out there. And she didn't get uh, recruited the, the traditional way Joes get recruited. And she isn't from the traditional streams of recruitment. Uh, she... Uh, she is a unique individual who possesses a form of savantism that grants her total organic battlefield awareness and she can identify and solve complex physical calculations above human rates okay it freaks guys out how quickly she can solve a problem based on physics or information that is just in the room that nobody else can see everything she sees has a data set field conditions enemy positions ammo count and threat assessments uh making her a living computer and uh she's a master of a bunch of fighting styles okay uh 
And then it talks about the tournaments to the death, walking or the scratch and everything like that. So I learned that. Uh, on the box, you can see what her loadout brings her with to this fight. You can see that she's got her Kukari uh, or whatever, the Gurkha style blade. She's got those twin Lotus blades, which are on her wrists. Uh, she's got the twin uh, Katana set of Via Kill Bill, Uma Thurman. <laughs> Uh, she's got a backpack for those blades and she's got the pistols, the 10 millimeter, as I read, uh, twin auto pistols. OK, uh, so all of this loadout is considered in the fight that she's about to go up against when she is going up against Storm Shadow in this one. And so we'll have a look at what we know and remember about Storm Shadow. And we're going to keep it more dialed in because we know a lot about Storm Shadow, guys. He's been around for a long time. So it, it just says codename Storm Shadow, that he's an assassin. Intelligence goes with the assassins. Uh, we know he's Cobra Commander's personal assassin uh, when we meet him. And we know that he's tied to his Akashagi or whatever clan, his family clan. In the movie, we learn his name is Tommy or whatever and things like this. Uh, but the driving force, it says, let's say, Storm Shadow can trace the family history through 30 generations of assassins, his Akashaki, or I can't say it, clan. Uh, he can scale sheer walls. It just talks about how good of a ninja is here. Uh, the great ninja can disappear for years, hundreds of years ago. They were wiped out, took credit. And who were they working for? Blah, 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 right? Uh, anyways, it's basically not... It's the old card. We know a lot more about Storm Shadow just based on the comic lore, the cartoon lore, how they developed the action figure, the fact that he bounced back between being Cobra and Joe and then back to being Cobra, you know, and he's very honor-bound tied ninja. Uh, the only reason he was ever with Cobra to start with was their goals were aligned. He uh, he was being manipulated and he wanted to find the, mur you know, the murderer of his masters or his uncle or something like Blind Master. And I think his uncle and uh all this travesty in his clan and he thought he thought he could get that information by aligning himself with cobra and i think the long story short was he was looking for zartan the whole time he didn't know it and that zartan was the culprit and so there's that whole is he more honorable or is he evil he's more honorable but he's been manipulated and so he's a very talented ninja unfortunately i don't have the classified traditional storm shadow uh any of those variants uh either the winter one or the original one that they based the retro card on i have the retro card version so when i account for the kit that he's got uh, it's based off the retro card version and I don't have a graceful way to show you that on the retro card stock So we'll just talk about what he's coming with. He comes with his bow and multiple arrows, right? So we that's represented with the quiver on his back. He's got a long sword short sword or what's it called? Akadashis uh, so long sword, short sword, dual fighting set, and he's got a set of three shuriken, uh, uh, three shurikens, and I say three, although two are only represented because he's got a hand mold that shows him with another, so I account for that in his kit, and that's about all I can do with it. Uh, the only other kit that's not being mentioned is the other hand molds. Uh, which aren't represented on here and they are striking but there's no additional weapons in there they are just holding hands or striking hands uh, or a shuriken hand so that is the breakdown of what storm shadow is bringing to the fight versus helix so already you can identify a bit of imbalance in what they're bringing to the fight but as far as the terms of combat goes we are dealing with a a highly trained extinct warrior type in the uh, ninja clans and storm shadow is the superior of all of them really uh, from what I remember of how they were writing him up and portraying him so you would think okay well helix versus the ninja is pretty cut and dry but the thing is I had to think about when I thought about how this battle would go down is uh, you know it's easy to think that Helix with her battlefield tactics uh, and, you know, the level of covert operative that they've made uh, her appear to be. It's easy for them, everybody to think, well, maybe she just out calculate and out manipulate. Um, and it's, it's a fair assessment because you can't tell me at no point in her career has she ever not faced a, a ninja type uh, opponent, especially in pit fighting or guys with a myriad of tricks like ninjas are known to have. So she does have an advantage fighting a guy like Storm Shadow uh, in that Storm Shadow has been around a lot and she can study what he's brought to the table in the past. 
Uh, Storm Shadow doesn't get that advantage with Helix as much because there's really not a whole lot of int out there on her and they make that very clear as well. Uh, and people don't tend to understand her advantages. So she's got an element of mystery to her and that will put Storm Shadow at the disadvantage. And did I consider that when I was thinking about the squaring? No, what I was thinking about the squaring is I wanted to have two combatants with a, a myriad of weapons that had a central focus more on when things got closer. So that's enough about our two combatants. How are we doing this? Okay, guys, I break this down into five critical rounds. All right, and Zaran is over here to explain those rounds with us. Uh, so what it is, is round one will be assessed on the ability to take the initiative and to engage. So who would be able to spot who first, what, what advantages would be there, and who's got the capability of engaging out of uh, beyond 500 meters uh, or beyond that. And so you've got to consider that. In round two... That will be the round where it is react enemy fire, okay? So after that first engagement, what do you do? What do you have available for 500 to 300 meters out? So this is you returning fire. This is you maneuvering. This is everything else about that, right? Uh, any kind of movement and reactive fire. In round three, 300 meters to 100 meters, it's win the firefight. So, and I know I'm talking about a guy right now who does not have a gun. So a firefight for him is the bow, it's his, his, his ability to bound and close distance, things like that. That's all incorporated as well in round three. Pardon me, my camera angles here. My camera is always the same as Tactical Perspective Toy Review. So, uh, so win the firefight is round three, round four, is take the trench, close quarters combat, getting up close, anything 100 meters and up. So the last rounds out of a pistol, the toss of a grenade, uh, the, the toss of shurikens uh, or, or a knife, uh, things like that come into play. Uh, as you get into the close quarters combat and that is where the skill of these two is gonna come on to display. Uh, and then, it's particularly these two, but all throughout, I'll try and keep it interesting. And then round five is your uh, consolidation round. What happens after the fight is once the victor is being decided in the close quarters, what happens from there? Is it a capture? Is it a kill? Is it an escape? Is it a let go? Uh, what other character tied relevant thing happens towards the end that may, may affect the outcome? Uh, I gave you an example of that with Firefly, how he lost a grunt. One of the things was he was captured because uh, Firefly is one of those kind of guys that we know through his lore that is basically, if it comes down to him and the, and the objective, sometimes him wins. Uh, and he chooses himself over maybe seeing things through. Uh, so I, I can't see Cobra risking a whole lot if the, the odds were definitely against them to go and retrieve him. So he got captured. So what's going to happen with the victor or losers of this round? We're going to find out, guys, as I tell you where we are for this fight. In this fight, let me just quickly get my notes and change the screen up to where we start. And this was the little bit of fun I'm trying to add to it, just for some, for a little bit of narrative purposes, guys. We'll go, yeah, we'll get there. So for this particular one, uh, like Firefly and Grunt, I had them in the passes of the call of the Rockies in Colorado or British Columbia. Here we find Helix in the. Uh, the downtown districts of Tokyo, Japan at night. Uh, you, know, you picture it somewhere like 11, midnight, 1 a.m. You do. You, you think of it. It doesn't matter, right? And so as we open to round one, we find Helix exiting uh, or uh, making her way across rooftops as she leaves the, com the commerce district uh, and bounds from rooftop to zip line to rooftop to zip line, eventually descending her way down from the, the, the building where she has stolen these hard drives uh, that link a company to the Paoli twins in the Crimson Guard. Anyway, she's made her way down these rooftops and she eventually comes down out of the, uh, the, the, the banking district and whatnot into the commerce district. And uh, she's carrying on with her exfil exfiltration route. And she's preparing to disconnect from her zip line. Uh, she's come down to the streets 
uh, she's getting closer to her motorcycle and as she makes a leap across a wider alleyway uh, between the, a noodle house and a butcher shop, she is suddenly and painfully knocked off balance in midair as a streaking arrow strikes her in the back. Uh, it hits her right between the shoulders, just inches below her neck. While it is hit right into that padding of the, the back sheath that holds her blades there, uh, it's got enough force and is sharp enough and expertly shot enough. Uh, and she did not anticipate it that it does, uh, part of the camera here, guys. It does end up penetrating and goes about a, yeah, we'll say a half centimeter into, into her skin. And it's enough to disrupt her and it throws all of her previous calculations of her leap out of whack. So she has literally milliseconds to, to figure out her landing now that her balance has been put off and the pain has distracted her. Um, and she does it, no problem, because her calculative mind has already taken into account the, the physics involved in that disruption and realized nothing was fatal here. So she is able to figure out her rotation and she lands with a sudden change in her plan, inverting herself so that she is now back facing the direction the arrow had come. Uh, and she lands square footed, we'd say maybe horse stance on the ledge of one of the building that the, the building she was trying to land on. And she is already calculating where this came from. And she's aware where this is an arrow. She's calculated what kind of threat. Okay, so that round one right off the bat is Storm Shadow having done Storm Shadow things. He's uh He's always going to have the initiative if he is hunting you. He's a, guy, a ninja. He's going to stick to those shadows and he's going to find you. And in this case, while Helix was getting away, Storm Shadow was able to, you know, do what Storm Shadow does and keep up pace, but also do that at a bow firing range uh, and picked a proper opportunity and a proper lead to strike a target that up to that point wasn't aware of him. Uh, that's going to change now that Helix is aware of him. So what happens as she gets into round two? Okay, so she's adapted her role. She's on that square-footed stance, and she would then get square to the enemy, put any kind of body armor she has forward if there's a follow-on arrow. But seeing that there isn't, she has time to reach back and get that arrow, and she's paying no mind to the arrow itself. She's just removing it from her body and uh, the where it's rested in her in her uh, sword mounts and she's going to instinctively using her data mindset and the fields of probability and everything she knows of, uh, being an olympic level athlete and uh, you know quite the assassin herself she doesn't even need to look at those white feathers at the end of the arrow uh she'll she'll know she's picking them up on her peripheral and she'll figure things out while she moves and so she just lobs that at just the proper arc. If you picture an Olympic javelin, she's lobbed that arrow into the air because she has already picked up on the trajectory of her assassin. And he's leaping from a building himself. So she thinks turnabout's a bit fair play. And she gave him the proper lead. But now Storm Shadow's streaking through the air. And he's all relieved because he threw some shurikens, but he didn't think that she was going to throw the arrow back. So those shurikens were just a bit to the left and they miss. And his own arrow now is flying back at him, but that also just misses him across the cheek uh, by millimeters, right? So, because uh, he's Storm Shadow. <laughs> so the arrow has been returned. He gets his roll and that takes us into the, the third round because we have basically a draw there. She threw the arrow back. He closed the distance. They, they're, they're fighting. But in round three, as Storm Shadow lands and a little frustrated that he missed with the shurikens, he starts pursuing Helix as she bounds back to another rooftop to try and gain more distance and more time to calculate the exact right move. So as she bounds from rooftop to rooftop to rooftop, he's continually following her. But as she bounds past one, he's about to leap over and suddenly he sees that the entire ledge is under a hail of gunfire. She's leapt down to a lower level and on her way down, she sprayed it with those 10 millimeter guns. Uh, you know, at under at under 200 meters, he's got a little bit of time to react, but not much. He's committed to the jump. So instead, he also does a miscalculation or a, a change of calculation. Mid like, and he decides to put that quiver between himself and the spray of bullets as he flips down to the same ledge that she was on. 
It's enough to save him and no mortal wounds. It wrecks the rest of the arrows for sure. And it, it definitely uh, it definitely foils any distance uh, plans to fire that bow again. But it saves Storm Shadow a lot of pain. But he does take one through the buttock because it's a hail of bullets and he had to calculate quickly. He saved himself a fatality but not an injury. So the round kind of goes to Helix for that ability to lay down that fire on an ambush scenario the way that she was able to do in the heat of combat. But now they're on the same ledge and we're going to get into the, the fourth round which is where Storm Shadow may be able to pull this out. He closes the distance using his bounding flips and, you know, all the stuff that ninjas do to close the distance. And Helix could try and calculate with those pistols and everything like that. But everything's happening at lightning speed and she needs to make a decision. And that decision is, it's going into close combat. It's time for close combat weapons. So she drops the pistols. She doesn't holster them. She drops the pistols and removes the swords from their sheaths in one fell motion at the same time storm shadow has closed that distance and he also has his swords out and just as he comes down hers are able to block his blade and she they're now into full close combat that sword battle will go back and forth just the way you picture it in any movie but in the end the combination of her blades and her lotus blades in conjunction with each other it is a whirlwind attack of kicks and blades out of Tesla that ends up almost overpowering Storm Shadow. It ends up knocking a blade out of his hand and he gets down to one blade, right? So we're not at Consolidate yet, we're at this phase. And, and what ends up happening is Storm Shadow resorts to his skills and experience as a ninja and puts him up against her ability to adapt. He's aware of what she's doing and how much of a threat he is as he fights her, but she has got him completely figured out as she fights him because she's experienced ninjas before, right? But Storm Shadow has also experienced people who could predict him before, and he realizes he's got to break contact. He'll do the least ninja thing that he can do to surprise her, and he'll strike her in a way that she didn't anticipate or there'll be some sort of distraction. Whether it's successful or not, the point is, is at that point, he's doing everything to break contact and he's using his cunning and he's thinking outside the box. And one final desperate move, he's actually able to remove the Lotus Blade from, the, from her, right? And he's disarmed her sword, but she still has her Gukari He's left with this in his own sword. It's not enough. She still overwhelms him. And she winds up beating the daylights out of him and knocking him out in the close quarters. She wants to kill him, but she knows better because she knows there's a history between them, between Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. She can also see that there's a myriad of Agasaki clan coming on, bounding in after her, rooftop to rooftop, to make sure that Storm Shadow does not meet his end in such a dis disorienting way. Uh, so that's how I see it kind of going, guys, is that in the end, Storm Shadow would be retrieved by his ninjas. Helix would probably, she'd probably kill him. And in my thoughts here, I would think that maybe she knows about the connection between him and Snake Eyes. And maybe, maybe the, I've thrown in some factors that prevent him. But she would definitely have, I think, the opportunity and the ability to put an end to Storm Shadow based on her advanced fighting techniques and the amount of weapons that she is able to carry lightly. Uh, and what Storm Shadow is restricted to through traditional and conventional weapons that he's been tied to as a character. Uh, I don't think I did enough to sell Storm Shadow's uh, abilities in this, but also the, the problem with Storm Shadow is that he's a categorized fighter. And I mean that in that he has a classification that somebody else can experience through that uh, fighting other people in that classification. So he's a part of an Agasaki clan. He's got a style of fighting. Uh, and whether that's regarded as secretive or not, it can be compared to other fighting styles, things like that, that she's prepared for. What countered it for Storm Shadow is that he cannot 
anticipate what she can anticipate. He cannot calculate the way that she calculates. And he can, uh, while he can think outside the box and adapt to a situation and a fight, and that's been shown throughout his character and throughout the lore, uh, this is, that is, that is just learned experience with him. It's instinctive and inherent and almost a superpower with her. It is a advantage she has that's beyond the human standard. And Storm Shadow, Tommy, is a very excelled ninja, sure, but he's still human. So he achieves a human standard and with that mythical art, right? And whatever comes with that. But in the end, uh, based on the reading, based on the loadouts, based on what I've understood of these characters and the lore a little bit, uh, I think the decisive outcome would go to Helix. That's it, guys. If you agree or disagree, you can put it in the comments. If you think I've missed some critical points, uh, go ahead and say what they are. These are really off-the-cuff one takes. Uh, there's about maybe 10, 15 minutes of prep, a little bit of fun thought, and more just doing this to figure it out myself. So sometimes I think it out while we're doing it, but uh, the five-round rule is going to stick, and uh, that's basically the format you're going to see. So uh, the next fight I think uh, we have on tap for this one, I'm going to be doing a Sergeant Slaughter versus Croc Master scenario. And then uh, we'll see where it goes from there, guys. If you have one you want to see and, uh, and you understand that these are restricted only to the classified figures that I have in my collection, and which are quite a lot. Uh, if you have any suggestions, let her rip. Anyways, I'll talk to you next time. And don't forget to hit like or subscribe if you enjoyed these videos. Talk to you next time. Bye.